Hello, this is David Hilster. I am a critical thinker, a dissident scientist, and I don't even have my logo up because I've been screwing up. I know, I apologize for everybody. I just started this and I didn't have my vocal, my mic on because I had everything screwed up because I was interviewing none other than Dr. Alexander Unsker, one of my favorite people of all time in the dissident world today. And I did uh, finally did a inter- uh, number of interviews with him on Tuesday and they've been coming out in the last few days. And what did I do? I sat here and talked for about five or six minutes. Wasn't even paying attention. I got a look at my, uh, I lost a bunch of people, I'm sure that for the night that they came to to watch me. And um, well, that'll screw things up. Uh, Man, that makes me mad. It goes to show you, and I, I really need to be more careful about when I do these things and really make sure everything's working, go through a checklist, that kind of stuff. Uh, I even get a, I, I'm even here ahead of time. I just assume those things are working and I apologize about that. But I don't want to be here about talking about that because those people are going to watch this recording. They say they don't care. What does that have to do with anything? So uh, anyways, one of the things I did was interview uh, Dr. Alexander Unsker. And uh, one of the things I also did because of that, I decided to uh, put some recommendations on my website. So uh, a few people are uh, still around. And um, uh, hopefully they'll come back. Ah, darn it. Gosh, darn it. It's one thing I, I don't uh, do well in my life is when I screw things up uh, for and, and just don't do something right. It's like, well, oh, that's okay. Easy go. Rolls off my back. but And it doesn't, unfortunately. But uh, anyway, so uh, let me just keep going. I got a couple of people. I, I appreciate you guys staying around. And uh, so... Anyways, this is my YouTube channel uh, website, dissidentscience.com. And uh, this is, you can see, uh, there it is, the live session there. If you click on that, I'm imagining you'll get people. Um, uh, I got, well, I, there were three people, four, part, five people there, and they are n- not all there, but we have a couple here. Anyways, my Dissident Science channel has its website and here it is you can find that and uh, by going to dissidentscience.com and you also can see my new web page that I put on which is recommendations and the recommendations are basically things I'm going to start putting here that are must reads or must watches in my opinion to become science it's going to be something close to like science woke but in science woke we have a lot more stuff but these are the things that I think you should read of course there's um, the Higgs fake if you didn't get to see the interviews with Dr. Alexander Unsker, you should. Um, uh, he is, that definitely is a, you got to read that because it basically just really criticizes particle physics today. And that's something that people all, all say, well, no, it's, how could it be wrong? There are millions of people who know that's right. And the truth is there aren't millions of people that know it's right. There's maybe thousands of people who pretend it's right but uh, the rest of the people are very skeptical. Then, of course, there's Dinosaurs in the Expanding Earth, which is another book that will blow your mind, which is, I think, is a great way to get into dissident science because when you read this and you realize, oh my gosh, the Earth's expanding, and not only that, it's growing, meaning it's gaining mass. How could that be? We don't know everything that's going on in the universe. The, the data is quite clear. That certainly will open it up in a super interesting way and also answers why. Why was there gigantism? Why don't we have gigantic you know, creatures now? And we look at it like Jurassic Park and we're walking around with these dinosaurs all walking around. Well, why aren't they around here today? No, what happened? Climate change? No, it's basically the uh, gravitational field. The Earth has been expanding and growing. Uh, So then there's infinity universe theory. Infinity to me is a very, very important concept for the new, new science. You'll never have a part that something in the universe that's not made of other parts that means it's infinitely down you're not going to have the magical particle at the bottom of the universe where everything is uh, uh, there of course i have some videos and the denu effect i sort of coined that myself uh, from yonel denu this is a uh, in in a kid kitty's pool a really great experiment it took a lot of time to get that up and running and it shows what does it show it shows inspiration for physical models for um uh, yeah, I mean, can you guys hear me now? Um, you should be able to hear me now. Are you hearing me now? Hello. Or am I in the wrong one? 
Maybe there's another one up now. Oh, there is. I'm in the wrong place. Hello? Let's see. Can you, can you guys hear me or are you there? Say something. Hello. Man, this is going to be a bust tonight. I think it's, uh, I made this mistake. There's two of them now. But I think this must be it. I don't think uh, both of them are there. Yeah, this one this one is like uh, nine minutes of nothing. Okay, yeah. So uh, that one I can probably delete. But anyways, um, I apologize for those people who are watching this uh, uh, recorded. This is probably going to be... Uh, well, there we go. We're getting more people here. So uh, I apologize, folks. Fast forward. <laughs> Fast forward. Not now. Uh, but anyways, uh, this is the Yonel Dunu effect. Uh, the Dunu effect, which I call. And uh, again, this is on my website, dissidentscience.com. You can also go to recommend.dissidentscience.com. And uh, you'll get these. And here's the expansion tectonics, Niels Adams. So just to put it lightly, um, uh, that was a wow when I read this book because I thought, oh wow, we've got a real physicist going against things. This was a wow finding this book to me. It was an aha moment. Infinity and actually it was through the universal cycle theory, which is really has a lot of the same stuff. Uh, when I saw this in 2008, that blew my mind as well. When I saw this in 2008 as well, it was a big year. I saw the expansion, uh, uh, the videos from uh, uh, Neil Adams, and I just was totally convinced very quickly. This is, an, uh, this is a um, video where you have uh, a lot more philosophy going on. So um, those people who uh, are into more philosophy, they're going to like this but it, it is a heavier video. Then we have, of course, uh, Einstein wrong. I talked about this all uh, in my first video, which was a total uh, um, wash because my audio is off. Man, I, I'm, I'm not gonna live this down. That's one of my problems with me personality wise is when I make a mistake, I just go nuts about it. I can't recover. I, I, I need to recover. It's funny because certain types of things I'll do fine, but when it comes to things that I'm trying to do creative, getting people here, um, that one I, I seem to like freak out, which I'm freaking out right now. But anyways, uh, Pine, uh, this is uh, the uh, poster for the movie. And um, then there's this other movie called uh, Cosmology Quest. And uh, those uh, Cosmology Quest is a... A documentary on the uh, Big Bang and of uh, those who want to see arguments against the Big Bang they really go through this quite well uh, Randall Myers oh you know I'm just repeating I feel like I'm repeating myself but I am repeating myself but I didn't have the audio so uh, Randall Myers uh, in fact was um, a com the director and producer of this documentary and he says when he wanted to have his friends over and put them to sleep, he had them watch this documentary. Uh, it's not because it's bad. It's just because it's not an exciting thing for people who are not into things like the Big Bang being wrong. If you are into that, it's a great series. It's on uh, the Internet. You can just come here and watch it. I think this one happens to be cut up into pieces. This was probably uploaded at the time where YouTube was not allowing very large uh, uh, video expanses now they allow hours and hours so uh so those are so that's you know again uh, under the recommendations if you go to my website and click on the menu it's under recommendations and that's new so i hopefully will be sort of adding to that so hello everybody i don't see anybody talking because everybody who was talking and with me was saying i can't hear they sort of went away and now they're no longer around so um up oh, there is a fourth person. Hello. Uh, I'm not seeing chats. Is, is it all messed up because the chats are wrong? Is that what's going on? Um, let me see here. No, the, these, I need to get rid of these things too. That's what I should probably do is um, 
actually get rid of those uh, videos because I think people are getting mixed up and they're not going to come by. So um, this one is live. And people are coming in and out. So uh, yes, folks, um, I apologize for that. I do want to talk about something today that's really interesting. Uh, I also usually answer questions, but we had people here, like I said, and the regular group probably scattered because of uh, what I did. So uh, I am trying to recover from that, and hopefully maybe we'll have people coming in later. But I think the problem is right now, is now with all of the things that people are saying, they're going to be really mixed up. Uh, but um, let me get rid of these while we're talking here. But the idea was for me, at least that was the idea for tonight, was to talk about um, uh, problems with uh, when you have dissonant scientists uh, like uh, you you um, learned a lot from, like, like myself, I have many people who my dad and I, it's, um, particle model stands uh, upon their shoulders and oftentimes those people either stagnate or they don't go as far as you would like them they've got their own quirks so that they don't get out uh, maybe they're loners um, there's all kinds of things that could be going on with with those um, with with people who are um, that you've, you've, you've admired over the years and um, it's just okay I see here that I have um, okay it says it's live uh, live replay January 18th so I'm gonna get rid of this one I apologize don't don't go away folks I'm just trying to get rid of the uh, uh, this here uh, but but one selected and I should be able to delete this one, shouldn't I? Um, yes, right here. Delete. And hopefully this won't go away. So, yes, I will do that. Now we have that one not being confusing. So, um, anyways, upcoming. All right. So, um, I appreciate everybody uh, being here. We, uh, my topic for today, as I mentioned, was going to be disagreeing with your dissident uh, heroes. Uh, I, I showed you my recommendations page, and one of the one of the one of the things that's the saddest thing for me. There's a couple things that are actually sad when I've been dealing with all these amazing people. Is number one not being able to get them recognized necessarily. Uh, in the way they should be recognized. Uh, having them around for many years. Uh, I joined the group in two, 1996. I was 36 at the time. And um, my goodness, 20 or more people who I greatly admired, many people, including John Chappelle, who started the group, have already passed away. They've died. And that in itself is sad because, you know, somebody like Bob Heaston was uh, somebody I always remember because he could literally take your paper and, and while you're giving it, go through it and make criticisms. The guy was so brilliant, he would read a very tough paper right while you're doing it and give you back amazing things. And he'd just hand you the paper with, with uh, uh, comments on. He worked with uh, Peter Marquardt, who's still around on the he what they call the Heaston Force, I think maybe it was called. Basically, what is the, what is the highest gravitational force that you could you could calculate what would be the because it's not inf infinite believe it or not it's not an infinite point with infinite mass like in the middle of a black hole as described by a lot of people but um you know and then we had uh neil munch who was a guy who picked me up uh when in 1996 when i was in flagstack arizona at the university of arizona to go to the first conference and he picked me up uh, uh i didn't have a car he's kind enough to do that and then um you know, uh, sharing a room with John Chappelle, uh, hearing about stories there that someone threw hot coffee on another person because they were talking about some thing, some philosophical thing about relativity. And, um, you know, just these amazing people and these amazing minds. 
and you know the first thing is just to see them dying off we try to give awards every year for for people who we think like how narp we gave that award i'm going to see if i can try to find the video we had video of uh, our presentation to Halton Arp, um, and uh, that was something I think I arranged to do. I said, let's do this, and we actually sent um, the, uh, I, I, was, I made these uh, sort of trophies or whatever, or these plaques. They're really, really nice. They were designed by uh, Greg Volk, and I, I was lucky enough, unlucky enough to have to make them, and uh, we, I sent them to Halton Arp, uh, just before he passed away and um, you know it's just tough to see these people go without them being recognized it's um, you know and then I have my mentor as well so um, yeah throwing hot coffee yeah um, it actually happened at one of our recent uh, recent uh, uh, conferences now no one's gonna go no it's people get heated up in the moment and uh, no someone didn't take a whole carafe of coffee and throw it on someone to get three third degree burns or anything like that but you know it's probably usually a cup of coffee with a little bit of coffee and it's probably not scalding coffee but yeah people you know it's their passion it's uh people get really upset sometimes with what they think is complete illogic you know just what they think is stupidity and then they take that out by <laughs> throwing something on somebody so um, anyways, um, what, what I'll, all I'm going to do is I'm going to show you a couple of examples of this. And I figured this is a good one. Instead of making a video that's more formal about this, I thought this would be nicer to be for the, the live video. And, um, you know, just talk about things and be able to interact. That, that way I'm, I'm able to maybe, I think in these longer videos, I can, uh, even though I ramble a little bit, I give you a, li a lot more of the context, whereas when I have my videos and I have points, I usually try to keep the, those points. I don't get off text too much, so you don't a lot of times get the whole nuance of the feelings, because they're mixed feelings. Um, the mixed feelings for me are for people who, um, they have disagree with me, I've disagreed with them, they've not done things that I think would have been great for their own careers um, I've sort of looking out on the outside being students of theirs and uh, so uh, let me take a look uh, at the first person I want to talk about today um, is who is my mentor Dr. Car uh, uh, Karazani um, he uh, this is a portrait taken by the famous Herman, Her Her Herman Leonard look him up folks Google him uh, he's uh, got his works in the Smithsonian. And in fact, the way I found him is I saw him on a PBS program back in the earlier 2000s. I think it was like 2003 or something. Then we went to New Orleans where he was uh, living. I said, hey, do you want to photograph one of the famous scientists of our time? You know, and uh, he said, sure. And so um, I, I brought him, I, I took Karazani to meet this guy. And in fact, because of this, uh, one of the things I do want to show you is that I actually found some of the photos that were taken from this. And um, uh, let me go down here. Here is a photo of Dr. Karazani. Um, these are really low res, I apologize, that's all I have. Uh, and Herman Leonard, who was in the 70s, Karazani, who was in his late 70s or early 80s, and this is his assistant and girlfriend, who happens to be like 50 years younger than him. But of course, you know, that's, I am totally open. I have no problems with that. But that was her, his assistant, and being him being a famous photographer, she was her assistant. And uh, what happened during the shoot is that we couldn't go, and I, we couldn't actually take photos during the shoot. That is, while he was shooting, uh, Karasani, the photographer does not allow anybody to shoot, but he allows her to shoot him shooting Karasani, if you get all that. This is them uh, discussing at a restaurant where it has all of Herman Leonard's works. I think this is one with um, Miles Davis, super famous. Again, I talked about this guy before. Um, there I am, oh my goodness, long hair, beard, a uh, little chubbier. That's when I was 
not on my all plant-based diet. And he actually, Dr. Karazani was on a vegetarian diet, very strict because he had bypass surgery. Um, this is the owner of the restaurant um, and they wanted to pose with one of the smart guys. There I am in New Orleans. There we are. He was uh, taking us around the district. I mean, to be taken around the, the district with uh, Karazani and um, uh, uh, Herman Leonard, uh, who's gone. I don't know if Karazani, I, I have not, unfortunately, I haven't heard about that, but uh, that was pretty cool. Um, here, Karazani was actually talking to Herman Leonard, trying to explain what he had found about Einstein and his work. Um, and I was allowed to take pictures of that. So you can see uh, this is a studio here, which is an old building, which he has uh, quite, uh, you know, all white here. And then you can see his camera in the background. That's why I sort of took it there. That's his assistant and his uh, girlfriend. And uh, there's Herman Leonard and there's Karazani. Um, I just dug these up. We're uh, there around there. I took some pictures of my own trying to be like, hey, I'm a photographer too. I, I do like photo. I, I am an artist. Again, people who don't know it, go look at dhilster.com. Go look at my port. You know, I've been drawing since I was three. So I, I have, you know, artistic ability, but I've all, always done it for myself. I, I've, I have people who've collected it, but so I, I pride myself in, you know, doing good compositions. And I thought this was a really beautiful photo. Uh, this is uh, Her, uh, Herman Leonard sitting there with his, uh, you know, he's got this jewelry on and then there Karazani, right, you know, doing some pretty neat uh, diagrams. So that's pretty cool. This was a, look at that hair. What's the hair, Dave? Looks like a woman's hair or something like that. And my wife and my daughter would just kill me. Um, and, uh, you know, all three of us there. And she took a photo because she was allowed. So she wanted to take some photos of us three. Um, there was a couple. This, not, this is a photo taken of, not of me. I mean, I didn't take this photo. This is a photo of Herman Leonard taking a picture of, of Karazani. Now, for those who don't know, uh, Herman Leonard was an assistant like that girl was an assistant to a man who photographed einstein and i can probably look that up uh while we're doing it but i think uh herman uh, leonard photograph einstein he was with this i think uh, uh during a portrait session there you go yeah um there's a story about him, so let's see here. Einstein. Einstein. It says, um, I'm reading on another website, it says um, Albert Einstein comes for, oh, gosh, it's so, um, upon graduation from Ohio University, oh, he is from uh, the Ohio area where I grew up, he took a chance and drove to Ottawa, Canada in hopes of working with the famed portrait, portrait photographer Yusuf Karsh. That's right, Yusuf Karsh. Karsh was impressed with his determination and took him in as an apprentice. Herman assisted Karsh in the dark room with photographing, uh, uh, photographic sit sittings, including Martha Graham, Harry Truman, Albert Einstein, uh, were some of those. Uh, and and uh, advice to Leonard: tell the truth, but in terms, but in terms to beauty. So, um, and he says, during the portrait session uh, of Albert Einstein, Leonard questioned the professor about the connection between music and, and mathematician. Einstein's response was improvisation, <laughs> which of course then he ended up being jazz. So these are some interesting stories, you know, and to have all that happen, you know, it's just weird because all I have been doing is trying to hang out with these guys who I think have been some earth shakers uh, and in Karazani, who was the one who got me in here into all this, and this is why I'm here today. And I got, and I've gotten to do some amazing things, uh, and be with some amazing people. So, um, there's another photograph. Um, I think I took that one. Uh, we're back again. So, um, going back to, uh, Karazani, um, you know, his work is really quite amazing. And I think um, what happened to me and my, 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 what I'm trying to talk about today are basically dissidents uh, who you are, or your dissident heroes when you disagree with them. And uh, I, I have uh, actually a, on my website for Einstein Wrong, um, let me see here. 
for Einstein wrong. If I go to that one, there is a, I think I have, do I have an old, I think I have an old, um, I have an old uh, um, trailer. I don't know if we, let's see, do we have the trailers here? Videos watch now. Director's YouTube channel. Oh no, that's not it. Um, but anyways, there is a trailer, and on that trailer is an it's an old trailer. So um, I wonder if I can go to YouTube.EinsteinWrong.com if I made that. Nope, I didn't. So we'll go to YouTube. Up oh, where they're live, and. Uh, We'll go to Einstein wrong trailer. And uh, hello, hello, hello. There we go, official trailer. Oh, uh, this was a test trailer. And um, I will keep this uh, muted. But in this test trailer, it's pretty cool. Um, I think I've, I'm not sure I showed this one before. But uh, maybe we can uh, take a look at it. Uh, let's take a look at this if you haven't seen it. On the tree. Uh, I'm going to mute myself. Let's see if I can get this here, if this is audio output. Now, um, I'll leave this on and you should be able to hear it. Um, is it coming out? Let me know if this works okay for, well, Let's see here, audio, uh, input capture, properties, get the microphone, oh, that's the input, that's fine. I wanna do audio output capture, and that's why I make sure, USB speakers. Okay, so we're good, so I'm gonna mute myself, um, and I'm gonna do that. So let's give this a try. The fabric of space-time is unraveling. Einstein's theory of relativity is under attack, and there's someone who's hot on the trail. <laughs> I'm making a blanket, and uh, I'm not bending space, I'm bending the blanket. Can you bend space? No. Join an ordinary family on an extraordinary journey. Just when you thought it was safe for physicists to walk the streets, along comes Mrs. D to shake things up. Follow her as she takes to the streets to find out if the icon of 20th century physics is really wrong. You know, it's a possibility that uh, Einstein's theory is wrong. And uh, they may think that, but they don't want to say anything about it. So if we go in there and say something, then they're going to be upset by that. Oh, not for us. Not for us. I do want to stop here. That's pretty interesting. Um, if you go back here. Um, what, what, what you're seeing here actually is that we stood out and part of the movie is is that we were supposed to film at the Stanford Linear Accelerator and um, that's the entrance to the Stanford Linear Accelerator and it turns out that uh, five days before we we're going to shoot they were all excited about us doing it because it was the year of 2005 which was the 100th anniversary of the, uh, the Einstein's Miracle Year with the uh, his three amazing things he found, uh, at, it's called the Miracle Year. And um, we had, I was setting this uh, shoot up at the Stanford Linear Accelerator and for months, and the guy there, I think it was from Australia, he was like the, the, the um, media guy who was or working with the liaison with the, you know, they were having people, uh, they had a huge shoot there from uh, the guy who knew James Cameron, the guy from Alien, and, uh, no, uh, from, from the Terminator and from um, uh, Avatar and the Titanic, you know, he's a billionaire now. And uh, he, he uh, had a friend of his who was shooting a, a, the, the, the uh, series for Einstein 
and everybody was wanting that job in, in LA. I know I lived in LA at the time, and so this guy got this job. So um, I get call. Uh, I called them up and said, "Hey, are we going to film?" Oh yes. Oh, another another documentary film crew coming in. It's the year of 2005. Everybody's like frantic and coming around and they all felt like movie stars and all that stuff and then five days before we were supposed to shoot I get this call from um, uh, the guy from Stanford Lyric Cell and he's literally shaking his voice is shaking and he goes oh uh, sir sir um, but uh, 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 is this David uh, uh, yeah I said yeah it's da- what's, what's up and he goes um you know um, it's it's been decided that the community here at Stanford Linear Accelerator has decided it's not in their best interest that you film inside the accelerator. <laughs> and I just thought, oh my goodness. I was already prepared for that, maybe if it would happen. And that's why you get this Michael Moore moment out front. And that's what this is whole thing. We'll go back and watch that again. And then when you hear the siren out there, I was really filming and I thought, and they were watching us. There's a, if you watch in the background, what we're looking at is a, a, is the entrance, which has, you can't just drive in. You can't drive into Stanford Linux Accelerator. They've got a booth and you, you got gates. It's like, it's not like secure military, but it's almost, almost like that. But we were standing there and we were filming outside. They couldn't do anything because we were on a sidewalk in public property. So they can't get us for that. We're allowed to do this. This is totally legal. And so we, we, they were watching us and we were, you know, we were looking at them and I was filming my mom asking them, well, why don't you think we can go in there? And then we hear this, uh, this fire engine coming. And I go, oh man, this is going to be a great scene. And it turns out it was just a fire engine going by us. So that's what that scene was all about. So let me uh, run that by again for you. It's pretty cool. If the icon of 20th century physics is really wrong. You know, it's a possibility that uh, Einstein's theory is wrong, and uh, they may think that, but they don't want to say anything about it. So if we go in there and say something, then they're going to be upset by that. Oh, not for us. Not for us. Watch as this family enters the dark side of physics, where the legend of Einstein is not the solution, but part of the problem. Someday I will go faster than the speed of light. Watch as they turn the physics world upside down. Someday I will prove Einstein wrong. Einstein's theories are legendary. His image is an icon. And on the way, Mrs. D will find her own miracle year. For seven days and seven nights I walked along the tracks In search for something that I felt would ease my pain But all I found were dying souls who sat upon the ground They sold their souls and now their lives are lost in vain Oh, heaven help me as I try to find my way through life Oh, send me something that will help me find my way A simple sign to lead me clear toward my destiny Well, if you haven't seen it, you should probably try to see it. Um, you know, if, you, if you're here... If you send me an email to david at science uh, dissident science.com i'll give you a a free viewing of it it's 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 nice uh, that was a trailer that i made that was actually a test trailer it didn't up being our trailer um the composer which is which is a song i, I bought it for the rights for a dollar but he ended up being the composer for my film i did have money for my film i did pay him to do it the com- the, the music to this to my um uh movie is absolutely fantastic uh, a great composer my friend of mine and uh, those are poignant moments you know my, my mom's gone now and you saw one where I hugged her I was I was on the phone and that turned out that's when I found out that my I was having a, a, a daughter not a boy or I was found I was a girl and that was a live moment so you see those things as sort of poignant it's uh, 
great movie. It's a great, it, uh, it was a tough time for our family. We went through a lot of uh, tough times. You know, my dad uh, had a tumor on his lung, did chemo. Um, my my wife uh, and I had a child. She she has uh, problems having children, so it was a. It's got a nice human story to it, but it talks about Einstein being wrong. But um, what I wanted to tell you is in that scene there where you saw my dad's uh, bald head and my wife's pregnant belly, that was actually the time that was very traumatic for me. And the reason I'm telling you and showing you this is that um, Dr. Karazani, um, uh, I showed him the trailer and he pulled out of the movie. He said that, that that scene with my my daughter, with my daughter, well, it was my daughter, but my uh, father and my uh, wife with the belly was obscene, and he had wanted no part of the film, and that was super devastating to me. And it's hard because I was talking, you know, the theme of this thing is was talking about um, today was talking about when your your dissident heroes. Uh, disagree you disagree with them or you're, or something like this happens and um, you know so it's 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 something that uh, you know you have mixed feelings because Dr. Karazani is a brilliant man I don't even know if he's gone now I can't even find that information uh, I can't you know once if he is gone then you know there's you know, I know some things that other people don't know, and it's uh, about the situation with Dr. Karazani, uh, in in the sense of, uh, you know, uh, his works and stuff. Um, you know, it doesn't change anything. His work, I tout his work greatly. I credit him for opening my eyes to knowing that neutrinos don't exist, where neutrinos came from, that they're postulated ir uh, wrongly. And that was really the first particle or that they just postulated, didn't find. And then they that really started the whole movement of particle physics. And he, he really found, in my opinion, the smoke, uh, smoking gun mathematically and physically uh, that, that, in fact, the problem with special relativity is there are no two frames. There's only one three-dimensional space. There's not two of them. You don't have a frame on everything that's going around that makes, and their physics can't be the same in every frame. No, there's one universe with a one set of uh, the way it works. It works the way it works, and um, so uh, he he's a brilliant scientist. But I could never get him to present with at our group. Um, I had to present for him in 1993. He says, no, I don't want to talk to him. They're all wrong. Those people are all wrong. And it uh, turns out that some of them were very right that I found. And so I, I, I graduated from staying with him, and he wanted me to sort of be his um, student. And I am a student. That will never change. But I had to disagree with him on, you know, of course, artistically, and then, of course, I got my dad involved. And if that wouldn't have happened, we would have never gotten to our particle model because my dad came with a huge breakthrough for that. So it all washes out. But, you know, it's sad because now I saw him last on my 50th birthday. I'm almost 60. I'll be 60 this year. So it's almost 10 years ago. And um, he, he's, he's 22. He's going to be 98 this year if he's still alive. It's pretty old. Uh, he's on a Spartan diet. He he could well very well be, but I don't know. Do I? Am I mad at him? No. I feel more sad than anything that um, he is not recognized. But um, you know, and and he missed out on things like infinity, the Denou effect. Uh, you know, I I'm hoping that if you know if he were somehow to be able to see that my dad and I's work, that he would say, wow. This is right in line. I mean, it's it, it, we we have a dedication in our book, and it's to a number of people, and one of them is him. We would not be doing our particle model book, uh, particle model at all, without him. So, it's it's what do you do in those cases? What happens when you have somebody like Dave DeHilster, and he just doesn't believe the same thing you do? <laughs> oh, he 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 doesn't. He's not an etherist. Um, what do you do? Well, you not listen to him. Do you not say that it's valuable? Uh, are we going to be in that situation for a while? Yeah. 
We are in part. Of, we are in model revolution. Uh, read sciencewoke.org, which is still coming along. But uh, that's one example. Uh, basically, he dropped out of the film. It was devastating to me. I had to regroup myself because I was in the middle of filming and because I was expecting to do stuff with him. But I think he wanted it more to be almost bio biographical so about him. And um, I wanted to look at all the aspects, not just his work. And anyways, still a great man. Have only respect for him. Um, anybody who uh, believes in the neutrino shouldn't and if you don't if you do read his work study it and you'll see what he found uh, if you want the best refutation in my opinion of special relativity in a sense of a classical refutation uh, in, in mathematical and physical terms uh, I think he nailed it I don't think there's any better person who has done it I think people talk about it in more colloquial sense even my father who has a video on this if you go to cmp uh john chappelle natural philosophy society my dad's got one of uh, the videos there and actually it's got a lot of a couple thousand views um for us that's a lot <laughs> and um that was uh, uh but it's not the rigorous work that he did um so that's one person and uh let's see if i have any other probably not uh, I appreciate people sticking around. I just messed up like crazy. I'm sure we'd probably have about another eight or nine or ten people, but my audio sort of pump pumped out on me. So people sort of they'll watch this later. And I apologize to everybody who dropped out and now maybe watching it now, maybe not. But uh, people seem to watch these. I put them up, and um, you know they get hundreds of views in a, a short amount of time. So I figure people are looking at sometimes I think they you know go forward that's cool do whatever you need to do okay I'm going to talk about a second uh, person let's see is that a, that is a sad story it's unfortunate when people cannot interact effectively with others you know that's one of the things about the personalities of people who are you know dissident scientists they a lot of them have personalities that are very much misanthropes people who don't like other people in fact when I was uh, 20 years old I um, was in Oxford England I actually took out a loan to go there for the summer um, I didn't get there on a Rhodes Scholar or anything like that I just uh, took a summer program and paid for it and um, I was chosen to do a, a drawing there at New College which was founded in 1379 uh, it's a lot very new college 1379 <laughs> And so I stay. Uh, I stayed there, and I was chosen to do a uh, a drawing. Uh, it was an architectural group that was there, so I was like, you know, the best artist, I guess. I was chosen to do this drawing. I did this really nice drawing. In fact, I did the drawing, and I didn't want to give it to the guy, <laughs> so I did something I never did in my life. I copied the drawing, and then I and I kept it, and then gave it to my parents. And my dad has it's one. It's in my opinion, it's considered to be probably maybe my best pencil work I've ever done it's uh, when I was 20 years old but what was interesting to me and the, I'm not just saying this story for talking about me I'm talking about example of misanthrop uh, which is a person uh, anthrop anthrop uh, miss miss against throp anthrop anthropomorphic uh, means human so against humans um, I remember uh, being chosen by this guy and I, I sat with him in this amazing office in New College, set 1379, with this philosopher from Canada. Very, very bright person. And um, he sort of picked me out of the crowd of all the ki the students. And so I remember sitting there and I was discussing things with him. And I, I would just go at it philosophically. I didn't uh, know Karazani at the time, actually. I didn't meet Karazani for another 12 years. But I was still pretty cantankerous about my views and stuff and he said you, you're a misanthrope aren't you <laughs> and it was true because a lot of people were there were going out to the pubs and pub hopping and um, I at the time um, just didn't do that and I looked at my personality and then I look at all the people who I've met over the years through like Dick, Dr. Karazani um, and all the other scientists I've met Many of them have the same type of personality. 
they are just they're not you know uh, I would be happy doing my own studies and not interacting necessarily with people being out in the stream of life uh, there's so much to think about in your mind and what you can do and read I enjoy being with people when I talk about stuff it's just to go and dance and to do stuff yeah it, it's nice but um, you know it's like I'm an artist I uh, get tired of people going want to go into my studio and just paint or I'll just uh, do work on a book or working on some website or an article I'm writing on or a video but I think it's just part of the personality it's very close to autistic in some sense um, there's a lot of autistic characteristics so um, I pre people are still here five people here I appreciate you guys I, I still got some interesting things to talk about so don't go away if you're still here I'm not rambling about this for not, nothing for sure but the way I sort of recognize it with Karazani is I say to myself I still champion his work I tell I made this website um, uh, I upgraded because was an old website you know because my first website was actually 1995 in April and so uh, over the time I've updated this as a WordPress and I pretty much put all his works there um, you know um, trying to collect stuff when I get more stuff I put it there if I have any videos I'll put them up but regardless um, I look at it as I'm still his student um, the movie turned out really great I'm very proud of that I think once if everything hits like this that movie then will become a classic in the sense of you know actually being a first movie because look at this guy he, no one went to see this movie didn't even get into a festival and look at the and it's not be, it's a very good film film wise but it's more of the content and I expected it to do more until I realized that the 80 film festivals around the world I made it into the finals only of a couple because I had some people who were very interested in the subject but most everybody well everybody rejected eventually because they didn't want controversy because they said this guy's crazy Einstein can't be wrong how could this guy only this guy know and of course you, I was thinking this guy knows so watch the movie they're watching now and that's that's the good part and I've only had great reviews um, all the general public who sees it they've all loved it and that's because I had some really great editors who put together a great story for me and uh, I thank them uh, Andrea Tucker and Nick oh my gosh I forgot his name Nick uh, Tambury there you go all right so I'd like to talk about um, one other uh, person who I greatly admire and is a person that um, I disagree with on certain things uh, I understand where they are but this person in my opinion has put themselves down in history the ten assumptions of science and the scientific worldview neo mechanics and infinity um, doesn't matter what he thinks about geology he's a geologist and says that expansion tectonics has a lot of data that supports it but he says he doesn't because he makes a living off of being a geologist and he uses a quote-unquote subduction what does that mean well the expanding earth has the idea that there's not a whole lot of subduction the way that you keep a fixed planet the way this planet supposedly stays while how our planet stays um, supposedly I'll put it in a place where people notice there you can see you know there's Africa and South America and North America the way this planet supposedly stays in the same radius is that all this expansion going on here that you see in the middle here and up around here all that expansion that goes on has to be subducted that is it's it's growing in the middle like this and then it has to subduct so here's like um, North America uh, North America here and then the the Pacific Ocean comes and subducts sub ducks ducks under uh, that and that's how they say you have the fixed radius earth now of course you know the evidence shows overwhelmingly overwhelmingly that expansion tectonics is correct but here's a guy who he knows that I'm a student he knows I have this opinion about him I joke with him I said it's really funny because they're gonna your story is going to be known and that story is going to be of how you uh, have contributed greatly to science 
yet you have your own profession that has a conflict with going forward, which is geology. So he's uh, both mainstream and dissident at the same time. So it goes to show you in the same person, you can have somebody who in fact um, you absolutely admire. I am a student of his, absolutely. A uh, particle model wouldn't exist without him. And what uh, uh, I have to understand is that he will not accept expansion tectonics because he will, uh, I still think he consults. I think he's in his 70s. He still does consulting and he would probably, he thinks he'll probably lose his consulting job if he goes around saying the earth's been expanding. And he thinks that also implies there's no subduction. And I don't, that's, I don't believe that's true. There is a little bit of subduction, but not very much. So it's very interesting. And there's another one. The reason I'm looking at this one, this is his uh, scientific worldview. I absolutely think you should read this or subscribe to it. Uh, you don't need to agree everything, but this guy is, in my opinion, the best scientist, scientific philosopher of our time. Better than Kuhn. I'm going to say it again better than Kuhn. And it's not because he has a better idea of what a revolution is, but he, uh, Kuhn is considered to be a physicist philosopher. This is bigger, in my opinion. So uh, The Scientific Worldview is a book, and uh, you can get that book online and um, subscribe to this. It's scientific. It's The Scientific Worldview at blog, uh, blog.com. I believe, right? Yeah, blogspot.com, scientific worldview at blogspot.com. Now, let me show you something else I don't agree with him. Well, one of them is ether. I don't believe ether be correct, but I'm in the minority on that. But he talks about dark matter, so I'm going to search here for the words dark. Dark matter. Could uh, He was saying, well, can dark matter exist? First of all, he says dark energy doesn't exist. That's a truth because energy is in fact a concept. It's not a real thing. And um, looks like Debbie is here. Debbie and Debbie here. Oh, there's five other people. Yes, be the neutrino pages. Okay. Um, I'll, I'll get to those in a second. Let me just finish my thought here. Uh, dark energy, of course, doesn't exist at all because energy is not real. Uh, think to yourself, if you don't believe this, think to yourself. Uh, equals MC squared, for instance. In my movie, I said, I can make you doubt this equation, even if you don't really understand it too much, in three words. And those words are, what is energy? And so when you start thinking about it, you go, well, well, you know, it's, oh, you know, Dave, you're right. So energy is a concept. Dark matter is a, is a different matter. So if we look at that, so he does say that. Second, here's Glenn Borker, my guy my hero, my dissonant person I look up to saying, second, dark matter appears to be real. <clears throat> I don't believe that. 80 years ago, astronomical observation confirmed that galaxies have, have, have behaved in a way as if they have many more, much more mass than their telescopes can see. <clears throat> uh, my father has a great explanation for this. If you haven't seen it, go to Particle Guru and Dark Matter. Look at Particle Guru Dark Matter absolutely brilliant my father has a brilliant explanation in fact he shows a graph in it that's shocking simple answer to the question the the gravitational field inside and i have also one you can look at the dark matter and dissident science the gravitational field of a galaxy is not uniform the gravitational field in our galaxy and in, in our solar system isn't uniform why because we have planets tugging on each other we are we, our planet our orbit the earth is affected by all the other planets and now you got stars everywhere and they're in their bands and they are in uh, arms you've got a gravitational field that is up and down literally and because of that the stars on the edge of the galaxy travel faster not because there's dark matter that we can't see it's because we are calculating gravity to be a a point in the middle of a perfectly a perfect sphere we know of supposedly how much um mass is in the in the galaxy by estimates we put it all in a point and say it's all uniform 
Another person who did this was um, uh, Cameron Rigbisol. Cameron Rigbisol. Um, he also has, I'm not sure I did one on his. If I haven't, you should do it. Uh, in fact, I'll look that up right now and show you that. Wiki naturalphilosophy.org, which is the only wiki that, that you should ever look at. No, I'm just kidding. Uh, Cameron uh, Rigbasol. There he is. Rigbasol. Really brilliant guy. Um, lives in Vancouver, Washington. He better be at our conference because where's our... Guess where our... Oh, no, it's in Seattle, Washington. Sorry. Uh, anyways, let's go to his paper here. Um, it's a fantastic paper. I recommend it. In fact, I have it put it, the whole paper here on the Wikipedia. And we do have equations, so we have latex equations. It may take a few seconds or a, a number of seconds to come up because it is making the equations look very beautiful in latex. But this is a very interesting, and there's a lot of, it's a it's complicated paper. But um, if you come down here and take a look, here's the graph my father was talking about, which is the speed of stars. Um, Guess what? You see, see like, oh, uh, there's n no mass here. Oh, they're in the arm. They're out of the arm, and now they're near the center. This is like a graph of the intensity of the the matter, and the and that's it's gravity. Gravity has going to have that same intensity, less and more. You put lots of suns together, it's more mass. It's going to have a bigger gravity. So this this whole thing, and this is of course is the way we think it's supposed to be going because of our equation. Why? Because we treat it as not, as, 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 anyways, he starts to take things down. He says, let's calculate gravity in pieces, because if I have a, a rectangle, gravity is not going to be a point mass gravity in, in, a, in a gravitational field. That's a sphere. This ain't a sphere. It's like one of those uh, potato asteroids. It's not got a, it's not got a uniform gravitational field. So he's calculating a star next to an arm, which will He's just doing a very simple analogy to um, the uh, spiral arm in a galaxy. And you keep going with all this. He's now doing it on both sides because he's going to try to see if, in fact, that stars are going to speed up because of certain points and positions around these things. He's now making it look more like a galaxy. Yes, galaxies don't look like this. This is a simplification. And so he calculates all this stuff and he's calculating, see, the stars. Now he's calculating a bunch of stars at the end. Now what he's going to say is that the velocity is going to be different, but only using Newton. So if we go back to the scientific worldview, and he says that it's been confirmed because we're not measuring what we should, I say to Glenn Borkert, and if he's watching, Glenn, read Ribasol's, read Cameron's paper, read my dad's paper on this. They explain. Newton can explain it. We don't need dark matter. We don't need dark energy, but no dark matter. But that's what he says. So... Um, that's, I wanted to show you a second uh, version of, a, of somebody who I admire greatly, who's a geologist though, and will not go to expansion tectonics because of the pressure he has in his own profession. I'm absolutely sure of that. He's also convinced, like I said, in subduction. Uh, therefore, it, it, can't, it can't be expanding because you can't have subduction. That's, that's the problem. What, what Dr. Um, uh, Borkert says, is he'll say, well, subduction proves the Earth's not expanding. That's not true. There can be, I've told him, there can be expansion, ex, uh, expansion, uh, uh, subduction with Earth expansion. Yes, there can, and I can tell you where it would be. That's only actually happens to be along the coast of North America. But again, we have explanations for that. So that's pretty interesting. So anyways, so those are the things I wanted to talk about tonight. Uh, I've already spent an hour. Uh, let's see if um, we have anybody making comments. Very few. And I apologize again, guys. I appreciate you guys being here. Uh, expansion tectons is something I studied beginning back in the in the 80s, which uh, time I worked as a geophysicist. Oh, wow. Uh, per calculation, subsections can't, cannot occur. Yeah. I mean, um, honest to goodness, let, let, let me just show you. Um, where can I show you? Oh, I know where I can show you. Uh, so, yeah, uh, Debbie, this is interesting. I agree with you. 
Take a look at this though. This this one you should read. Um, expansion tectonics. This is an encyclopedia, folks. This is an encyclopedic entry, the best one on planet Earth, on our expanding planet Earth. This was written by do, no other, none other than Dr. James Maxlow himself, and you can see it. It is large. And he talks about a lot of stuff. So this is what we would like to have in Wikipedia. But guess what? Wikipedia won't have us because it's the, the mecca of consensus, right or wrong. They don't allow new ideas. But I, I do want to show you one place here. Oh, I'm doing it again. Let's start over. Oh, I'm going to uh, our Wikipedia and expan expansion tectonics. You can see that this is what we call a dispute, a Wikipedia dispute. And um, here on this page, let's go back to it. This is the best, I'm sorry, I was talking about this. This is the best uh, encyclopedic entry for um, expansion tectonics on the planet. So uh, let's go back to this. And I wanted to mention Debbie, um, I want to call you De AKA Debbie. Um, and you know, I'm sure I do not have to explain this to Debbie, I'm sure, because she probably knew, you knew about this Debbie before I did. I came around this in 2008, so you're much further along than I am. But I do want to show you one place on the planet that in fact could be that there's subduction. And where's that? Look at right here. What you have here is are the expansion lines, right? Here's the problem that of course, <laughs> mainstream plate tectonics can is not going to be able to explain and that is expansion 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 all around arctic antarctica this is literally all around antarctica that means let me push this up a little that there's only expansion around uh, antarctica there is no subduction there's no place that could be subducting uh, supposedly well, i guess it's supposed to be subducting it would have to all of Antarctica would have to be subduction. What subduction means again is that when you're here, here's Antarctica, that when you're here, all these lines, you can see the lines literally of the growth lines there. Those growth lines that this supposedly keep the same fixed radius earth, this, this literally is moving. This stuff will move, you grow, 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 grow. That's what these lines are. This used to be up here. This used to be up here. This is moving in this direction and it should be subducting here, going under the continent of the, the Antarctica. Now, if that was happening, you'd get volcanoes and stuff like that. I guess there may be some volcanoes there. I mean, so I don't wanna say that. But anyways, um, anyway, let me show you Debbie right over here. And here's my claim that there probably is some subduction. So you have all this stuff and this is growing. And this is really close. You notice that here it's far away. So this stuff is just, you know, going away. Um, this too. But here is the most bizarre place. And this is where subduction and a lot of the geologists live. And you can see this fault line right there. And that is this stuff is coming here. But what about the other side? Because you notice on every one of these lines, including up here, there is, these are growth, they are growing in this direction, in this direction in this direction. So this is going this way. Where's it going? Probably under the continent. And if you notice, there's some, the biggest earthquakes we ever had was up in, in the United States has been Alaska up in this area. So right here in California as well, this stuff, what's happening under here? Is it just spreading out here and not over here? Maybe, but could there be subduction here? There could be because you have this side going this way. This way, this way, this way. Well, maybe it's right here, it's subducting, but maybe not. Maybe it's only going in one direction, but certainly here, I would say that could be subducting there. Okay, I'm um, sorry, I should be talking. Expansion technology, something that is so amazing. Insufficient material strength to incur and forces involved. Yep. That's another problem with the, with the idea of subduction. Uh, with subduction, you have, I don't know if we have that here. Oh, here's, here's the expansion, stuff coming out. Shows you how that happens, how we went from 
no uh, shallow lakes and stuff like that and then this starts filling in with water um, and how this is working how the spreading is going on um, I don't know if you have a subduction picture here oh there's missing Um, not seeing it, not seeing it, keep saying stuff, Dave. Not seeing it, this is talking about the... Here's the expansion, you notice it's um, exponential. It's not going, it's like for a long time going really slow, and then all of a sudden, it's going up. Exactly, just a little bit, the whole plate subduction to the depths proposed, yeah. Dark energy doesn't exist and dark matter doesn't exist. Yay, Steve Beck, good. Yeah, I agree with you completely i mean anytime you have dark it's you know this is just in the same line of the neutrino uh we postulate the neutrino we postulate the speed of light um you can't go faster than the speed of light we postulate that um gravity bends light we don't see it then we claim to see it then we have people like dr edward dowdy from nasa worked at nasa with laser optics saying we don't see it we only see it in coronas. Dark energy doesn't exist. Okay, agreed. I follow that, Dave. I just don't know. Didn't look. Uh, just don't look my age. No problem. Um, it sometimes crushes and builds up mountains ranges. Yeah, but you know where mountain ranges come from. Here, here's an experiment you can do. Take any big ball. I don't have my. I don't have my globe here. I love my globes. I got this one. Take a bigger globe, put tin foil over it, and then put mud on it. And let the mud get... I think there's something like that. I can search for it. Then let the mud get sort of semi... Uh, not hard, but not completely muddy and soft. Once you get to that point, and then you... Oh, on a balloon, I'm sorry. On a balloon start over balloon blow it up not all the way up uh and then tie it off in a way that you're going to untie it again and then cover it with mud take the mud and wait for it to be semi pliable uh somewhat um uh, dry somewhat wet blow it up and guess what forms mountain ridges how do mountain ridges form well if you've got this as a Let's do it even more. This is a continent like Africa way back 250 million years ago. It was much more curved than it is. When you uncurve it like this, what you end up getting is this pattern that you find along a lot of continents. And that that is, if you look at our continent, you don't have mountains on the shore. Then you have the Appalachians. Then you have this big basin. Then you have the Rockies. And then you have this big basin again. It's not perfect. But that's happened, and it, the what mountains are is coming from taking a curved surface and uncurving it. You get compression, that compression pushes up mountains. Pretty cool. In fact, you can look at mountain building in the new books. I don't know if I have that new book. I do have the new book, but I don't know if it's here. Not that one. Anyways, um, that's that. So we still got a couple people around. Like I said, probably half the people here because I screwed up. Anyways, um, look at the book I found. Andrew Pickering constructing corks. Someone asked me about that and some of the people that were already on my channel asked me about it and they were here today and I screwed up my audio. See, I can't get over those things. You know, what could have been? I could have a bigger audience, more people and you guys would have more people to interact with and, and uh, uh, I don't mind. It doesn't matter if there's even one person. But, um, so Andrew, constructing corks it says widely regarded as a classic in its field, construction quarks 
recounts the history of the post-war development of elementary particle physics, inviting a repraisal of the status of scientific knowledge. Andrew Pickering suggests that scientists are not passive observers and reporters of nature. Rather, rather they are active producers of the world through social symbiosis of experimental and theoretical practice. Constructing uh, uh, quarks chronicles what may what many have begun uh, begun to regard as a major revolution in the 20th century, discovery of quarks, and gauge field theories are strong electromagnetic weak uh, a prestigious piece of scholarship I can only hardly recommend. Um, uh, an admiral in history, because of his account so detailed and so accurate, is because it's so clear why physicists did what they did, and it is eminently suited to, to be required reading for all young physicists. So um, I did read this. I don't even remember if this is good or bad. <laughs> but um, this is something that um, Dr. Alexander Unsucker talked about, and somebody else talk, well, talked about with me and asked me about it, and um, I do have it. In fact, really interesting, I got an email yesterday from uh, Dr. Alexander Unsucker, who I just interviewed, who got an email from Andrew Pickering who he said the wrong, he's calling him David Pickering because of my name, and then Andrew Pickering sent a, mes a message because of our, my video I made a couple of days ago saying, what happened, you call me David. I'm just hanging around with the, with the cool guys, that's all. It's just an excuse to hang around with uh, very brilliant people. But, yeah, okay. Um, Anyways, if you guys have any questions, uh, that legendary tome, highly technical stuff, love it. Hey, Stephen Beck, can you tell me, is this one that criticizes at all the way they do things with quarks, or is it only Barbara Latham, 1999. This is, of course, a used book. I um, wonder if it has a table of contents. Hmm. Can you tell me, Steve, if anybody who's read it? Oh, here it is. Man of Machines, Old Physics, Quark Model, The Genesis of Quarks, Scaling at Slack. Woohoo! Slack. Been there. Didn't go inside. Uh, Partisan Model, Neutrino Physics. Oh, my goodness. Grand Unification Theories, The Gauge Theory. Looks like it's pretty much about, we'll see, somebody, November 74 to mid 74, the charm explanation had become generally accepted. This was the lever that turned the world in terms of, let me tell you about quarks. Actually, I need, did I do this? I think I did an, exp I did, I think I did one on quarks. If you look up dissident science and quarks, I think, in fact, I did one on that. Let me tell you about quarks because a lot of people who hadn't been around or seen all of my videos, because there's over 200 of them now, um, that is very interesting. Think about this. This is how quarks came about. I'm going to tell you how they came about and how, how come they're sort of screwy. I mean, just conceptually. Here's, here's the way, okay? I'm, I'm, I'm a person looking at the physicality of the universe. And I find out, oh my gosh, there are all these things we call atoms in the periodic table. So you've got like 90, 80 some really useful atoms that we found. And, and then we go, boy, that's it. We found the atoms. We found atoms meaning the smallest atom means A against Tom. Tome is like a tome, like a book is a tome. It's cut wood. It's like cut, cut. So tome means cut. Eight atom, you cannot cut. You cannot cut it any smaller. That's where the word atom comes from. It's an etymology, not an entomology, which is about insects. Etymology is the, without the N, is the uh, origin of words. So what you have is uh, um, an atom, and that atom, oh, we've got like, at the time, 80 of them. You know, Of course, now they have all of them, and they forced them and all that stuff. But, you know, periodic thing, maybe 100. Let's just say that. We're done. Nope. Now we found out that they're made, there are things, subatomic particles, and they're all made up and can be described as three particles. So now, instead of at, uh, 100 atoms, we now have one electron, an electron, and there can be more of them, of course, and we have neutrons and protons. So there are three. Now we've made the universe down into three. Then somebody says, in the 1960s, I believe, quarks, Oh, there should be an ultimate particle that will then 
make up those particles. So there'll be one particle that makes up all the other particles. And there's a huge problem right from the start because it's not one particle. It's six particles. We don't have six electrons. We don't have six protons. We don't have six neutrons. But we have six quarks. Oh, and then they went to nine. Oh, and then we, we went back to six. So the idea, the person who was the surfer dude, whoever you want to call, I always call them now surfer dudes because, uh, or the patent, the guy in the patent office sitting there, you know, the brilliant person who's going to change science said, oh, there's one particle that makes them all up, quarks. Problem was, he couldn't make one of them. But he made him one name. Then it turns out that they said quarks. Are, we only have quarks for protons. We don't have them for electrons. So electron is, doesn't. So the problem with quarks is, is that the idea was things were made out of quarks. Two things were made out of quarks. So we went from two in the nucleus to one. And, that, and they're made out of quarks. And they went from, but there's six of them. And they all have these properties that are like, you know, I don't want to get into that. Um, but uh, let's see, did he say something? It documented the alleged discoveries of quarks and, and the flaws. Oh, okay. Swept under the rug. <laughs> exactly, David. Okay. There are six different gluons in the standard model. Gluons. Now, I mean, that's another one. I mean, if you sit there and you t you get a room full of people who are very intelligent, let's say we would get people from Mensa, and let's say they really don't know too much or, or care about physics, which is very possible because physics is so screwed up. And you say, um, we're going to have a particle that is responsible for keeping particles together, and we call it the gluon. Now, what would you think about that? It's it's crazy. Glue, it, maybe it's a string or it's stretched or something because glue is not a spherical thing um, and I'm not sure they even know it, what it would be if they even try to give it physicality uh, you don't have to go very far to um, destroy in your own mind particle physics the way that they're talking about it um, so any any more questions um, we've gone only an hour and 15 minutes I'm sort of emotionally mad because normally you know at least we have like 10 or 15 people here today we have seven i appreciate you guys being here i know some people come in later um i know people uh do watch this afterwards but um you know i, th I think um i you know it's just like having my friends uh, one of the great things about our organization is what i would say to all of you right now is we are definitely in model revolution we are in absolute model revolution and i will give you a preview of that because once our i'm going to start to come up pretty cl pretty soon with a date for our science woke website coming out um things are going smoothly i i, I think i may have mentioned last week that or if i didn't i should but i mentioned last week that in fact um we have um a new editor who has joined our group for Science Woke. And uh, this is the com smashed version. If you come out here, it'll pop. See, now it's the big version. But if you move it in smaller so I can see both myself and you guys can see this, it goes to the tablet version, which then makes all menus like these little guys. But let's go to the About and our editorial staff. Uh, I apologize if I've already talked about this, but here's our hotel staff. That's me. Who cares? Uh, here we go. Alexander Unsiger has joined our editorial staff, so he will be writing. And Harry Ricker, he's already written 40 or 50 great articles. You can already read them, uh, but I'm going to be putting them out there. And Lori Gardy is just starting out. A fractal lady who's uh, oftentimes here but probably got thrown away because I screwed up the audio and decided to start over. Um, let me just show you here. Let's go back home. Just click on this. And I also put uh, this thing. It says right here, Science Woke, online science mag magazine for critical thinkers. That's what this is. <gasps> Model Revolution is here. And instead of read me, I have 
become woke. Isn't that pretty fun? It's gotta be like, so here's what I'm talking about. What you guys all have to understand, you're gonna get this status completed. This is a done article. I've been writing these big articles for months now. Model Revolution is here and here's why. There's Mr. Thomas Kuhn. And here is something that I put together myself. Basically, Kuhn cycle is you have normal cycle, then the model begins to drift. That is, the model just won't be able to explain everything. Then you have model crisis because it's really falling apart. And then you have model revolution where you have lots of different models that can fit all the data until you find a paradigm shift because there's one model and then you're back to normal model. That's sort of the, what the people have defined as the Kuhn cycle. So normal science, uh, model drift already started in 1690 because it's, uh, I say normal science is Newtonian. And yeah, oh, we went to electromagnetics. Well, we didn't because the way I look at it is we had mathematics for things, but we didn't have any physical model. We still have no physical model for light. We still have no physical model for gravity. So that's what I'm talking about. Physical models. And the models began to drift because in the 1690s, you started having people talk about luminous ether, that is particles that made light transmission and gravitons or uh, ultra mundane corpuscles <laughs> as they called them and that started in the 1690s model crisis the way i look at it came in in 1905 when einstein started this terrible thing that i will give you the laws of the universe and we will go find that they're correct like the speed of light cannot be violated of course if you get einstein key the einstein key lost einstein's lost key <laughs> Uh, we talk about Einstein even saying that light could be a variable speed, but nope, that's why we did it. And from 1905 on, we started inventing particles, and we started inventing things, the speed of light, gravity bending light. We invented that and said we found it because even though we were looking at through a corona of a sun, we also then invented the neutrino to save for special relativity. It wasn't there. We didn't find it. We postulated it, said it had to be there because our powerful laws of the universe that we super brain humans have are no more than the universe even does. So that we have to go and discover the things that we already know are there. Then the quarks came along and said, oh, there must be one particle. And it's not one particle, it's six, it's nine, the whole thing. Then we have WZ particles, gluons, and Higgs boson. And it goes on and on. Well, it turns out that we are in a model revolution from since 1690 until now. That the model drift came, the crisis came, but we have been still trying to find a model. And this is, we are living in a time where we have several models that are working well. Two of them very well. Uh, the ether model and the particle model. And so there are um, lattice models. I'm not saying that they're not valid, but there's not as many people working on those. And so um, anyways, eventually what will happen? One of these models will sort of like, hey, Jeffy's model's really good. We're going to use that one. Or Borkert's ether model, we're going to use that one. Or the de Hilster particle model, we'll use that one. <laughs> Hopefully not. My dad and I say, we can use it. It may be very useful technically, but is that really what's going on? We don't know. Can it be proved or can we find data to back it up? Don't know. Anyways, that's where we are. So if I'm telling you what that means is it's okay. It's okay to have more than one model. It's okay to have people giving papers about models that are different than other models. That's what model evolution. Uh, and it doesn't matter. What we need to know is that there are, is amazing progress going outside the, the mainstream. And this is what I'm currently writing, being edited. See, we even have our own uh, lingo. So I'm writing all about the new stuff. And there I am looking like important with Einstein wrong there. But uh, anyways, the idea is that it is okay to have models because we are in a model revolution. So that's enough of that. We'll be seeing that hopefully soon. You guys have been seeing it. So anyways. Yeah, see, Adam Lore, you have a lattice model. What you need to do, Adam Lore, go get yourself a make a slideshow, uh, um, 
a PowerPoint, as we say, which is, of course, a brand name, and give a talk on our Saturday mornings. Uh, Saturday mornings, we have, I don't know if I said Saturday, but I will put naturalphilosophy.org. And, of course, we're supposed to be announcing these things, and we send out emails but we we just then talk about stuff but you can get to get saturday mornings and uh here we go saturday morning so this is our natural philosophy this is our home natural philosophers and uh down to a big good 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 saturday morning video conferences so i'll click on this and i actually have to put the recordings because we have recordings actually this is only eight. We have got recordings all the way through January, and I haven't put up the database because I can't do a thousand million things. Plus, I have a full-time job, be president of two nonprofit organizations, blah, blah, blah. Just making excuses, not, believe me, it's not showing off. You don't want to do all that stuff, folks. Um, but anyways, um, uh, Adam, please... Um, uh, give me an email or contact. Come to this page here. Uh, Saturday morning videos. How do you get there? You just go to naturalphilosophy.org. Do it again, so you can see. Anybody here wants to give a talk about what they're doing? It's fine. Go down here to Saturday mornings. Click on this, uh, whatever. There it is. And enter into contact with Franklin, who our host. He is a wonderful host. He has the ability to talk about everybody's uh, um, work in a way that of course is hey uh, check this out and he'll ask he'll ask questions about understanding your work he will not he says i will disagree with it but in your model i'm assuming this is what you're saying and all that stuff and he's a really good person to um in fact host these so get in contact with him and put oh yeah he's gonna do it <laughs> say david sent you tell him dissident scientist sent you because I'm trying to tell people who are really good, you know, Glenn Borkert, if he would have a channel, I don't care. He wouldn't talk about um, play tectonics. He'd talk about the stuff he talks about. I would subscribe. I've been trying. I've got his whole channel set up. You don't believe me? Let's see. What is it? Infinity.guru. There it is. I even got a logo for him. I made a logo for him. Look at that. It looks like a Guru Infinity. Isn't that cool? See, I'm an artiste. I'm an artiste. Hey, everybody, send a message. Maybe what I need to do is to get him, you know, send him lots of messages. He's already got 44 people signed up and he does no videos. I've got a video with him. Get on his case. But anyways, uh, Adam, do it. We need to have more people talking about it. Maybe you have your model and you talk about it and make your own YouTube channel so people can learn about it. We all compete in the model triathlon or the model Olympics, and the winner will be the next paradigm shift. <laughs> Crazy. There are a lot of people who don't believe that, and um, other YouTube channels, one in particular that always puts a thumbs down on me, um i know who that person is but they they um s they have their own theory which is great um they're a critical thinker that's absolutely good i won't say the name because i don't i'm not into talking about people but basically though the person said um says oh by the way there's only one truth you can only have one model like you only can have one human language you can only have one computer language you only can have one type of planet Guess what? There's variety everywhere. And there's a variety, you know, how this universe is actually described could be described in different ways, maybe even different models. And we do that. Uh, what do you, we, we, why don't we have one model for all of physics of everything? So why do we have equations for electronics, uh, electric circuits? Why do we have um, the current, you know, current equals I over R, you know, whatever that is. Um, sorry about that, Dad. But, um, why do we have that? Why do we have um, equations for 
um, mechanical engineering? Why do we have the equations for Newton for buildings? Why do we have equations for material science? So when you build buildings, you can calculate the weight stresses and the materials. How come we have um, equations that are just basically ad hoc equations for putting together molecules because we don't have a good model of, of the, the atom we still come up with a model that we can use why do we have calculations that we use that are special calculations just for doing things in space um, all of those kinds of things um, so that's why we can have have things CPEC has a model that is particles ether and lattice all in one matterdoc.info what that's what you do it's hey you know what I call that that's the tutti frutti theory I don't say that in a bad way I already coined um, um, Duncan Shaw's ether theory the Vancouver ether theory because it was a uh, here it is alternative concept presented either explains physical models huh I've probably been here before. Gravitation, matter. Alternative concept presents a matter. Uh, I'm going to open this up. I'm going to get squashed. There we go. Uh, it explains physical phenomena related to matter using just a single fo uh, foundational assumption that substance is fund fundamental and matter alone provides substance to all real entities. I agree with that. One type of the basic ma uh, matter particle quantum matter derived from the assumption is required to explain all physical reality in the universe. Quanta of matter form an all-encompassing universal medium that pervades entire space outside of 3D. Authors explains why... Well, of course, you know, you can, people who have ether say, well, they have particles because ether is a particle. But that's different. You have to understand what a particle model means. It doesn't transmit, it doesn't mean waves aren't transmitted like air pressure. It transmits waves, but uh, light is transmitted a different way. Let's see. So the only thing I don't understand that sort of gets me a little worried is when I hear, when I see things like this quantum of, quantum of matter. Yeah, you start to get like then it gets to be nebulous but um i'm guessing i don't know unified theory that is applicable of all conditions matter i wish to present radically oh of course yeah i know yeah of course this guy um when does this happen yeah i know him yeah i, I recognize his face i remember faces i don't remember names very well Um, buy a book, matter, examine gravitation. Okay. Th yeah, he's in our database, I believe. I bet if we look this guy up, he's in our database. V V A R G. We'll just put him in the wiki because everything that's in the database should be in the wiki almost. Oh. That's what I say, not everything is. We'll go to our database, which is a database. Unless he had us take us uh, take it out. Sometimes we get that. There he is. There he is. Yes, we have him. Matter, ether, planetary motion. Yes, sir. He is from, is he India? Yeah. Electrical engineer. Yay. They're the best. Yes, sir. Oh, okay. So Steve Beck says the quantum of matter is the smallest bit. Of course, then you, I am your science therapist. Let me tell you. What do I tell you about ultimate particles how do they organize how do they organize so that's why I believe in infinity I don't believe there's a smallest particle gotcha but he does could be right maybe there's magical particles that make up the whole universe and they 
magically hold hands and start doing dances on their own with no the reason infinity works folks why does infinity work there is because any types of motions that happen like if you have light particles that are coming into waves and waves of light and it's white light which are just clumps of particles that are random and they uh, they hit a prism well they hit a prism they get filtered uh the the um, colors get filtered out because fil the frequency we have an explanation for that well um uh, what happens is for the, for light for a prism to bend light uh, there has to be some other type of force if it's a gravitational force at a lower level if there's like gravitons at the second level for like uh, the nucleons of atoms the reasons the, G, the the particles will go around that is because there's a G2 particle super small going C squared this is super fast and that's what makes that curve and then if that one is doing itself it just keeps going down and down so you can never have a magical moment wow i have to remember that you can never have a magical moment with infinity oh. lighting gosh darn it i get really mad at stuff it's amazing magical moments you can never have a magical moment you can never have a magical moment with infinity you can have the magical particles i suspect that actually the continuity uh, is continuity in existence it, uh, it could be what happens to be quantized is only the result of a cancellation of areas where the void seems to exist. Yeah, I mean, that can happen. But again, you still have to understand why is it there? Why did it wave? If it's not particle, if it's a particle without any parts, then is it infinitely dense? If it's infinitely dense, is it infinitely heavy? I mean, there's you've got all these problems with an ultimate particle. Same here, Dave. Infinity should be assumed unless somehow proven otherwise. It makes more sense. Yeah, it does. It also I like it because all this idea of parallel worlds that you actually just have. There's a space for everything. For instance, our galaxy could be an ether particle or a particle in a particle model. Could be a gravitational or could be a ether particle in a world where there's huge things and beings way up that we're just like one teeny part and we're uh, such a small infinitesimal instance in time to those things way up there that um, our galaxies are ether particles and we're and when they collide they're transmitting waves that are seen by other beings in a, in a super high level could be inside a chair i don't know all righty um anyways guys like i said i i got i got sort of it's an, I've been an hour and 40 minutes um, I've sort of talked about the things I wanted to talk about today. Um, and I think I'm going to head off. Uh, I apologize. Like I said, I usually have a lot more, more people here. A lot. Uh, I don't think I've ever reached 20. That's sad. Like the one guy said on, on my, uh, Facebook page, there should be millions of people subscribed to David. This is really good. <laughs> It is not a power game. What Again, if people ask me, the reason I'd love to have lots of subscribers, that means then we'd have a lot of critical thinkers, which means we could do more than our organization. Maybe we could have more support for it. We could do projects. Hey, I've got two projects. That's what we're going to do next week. I'm going to talk about two possible projects outside the mainstream. It just came to me, so I'm going to do that. Uh, that will what your appetite because you can, we can talk about them i actually got to do an interview with one of them <laughs> we've already talked about them but i think it'll be talk about them in more more sense but i've already talked about them actually all righty well thank you very much guys and gals and everyone for wherever you are in the world i appreciate your patronage um let people know about the, the channel i apologize for the stupid audio mix-up because i had problems with setting this whole system up for interviews and then when I did that I screwed it all up for 
uh, doing it correctly for today. I didn't realize I did that, and then I started over, and then I lost a ton of people. So, um, anyways, uh, I will get that. Make sure I get that corrected next week. I will check everything, double check, triple check, and um, thanks so much. And any more questions, let me know. It says, I don't believe that there's any reason to assume that the world is strictly quantized. It may appear to be quantized due to cancellation. Oh, you already said that. Let's see. You should promote your stuff in forums and get more traffic. Yeah, uh, I will. Once Science Woke gets up and running, I'm really going to turn on the knobs. That's for sure. And I know how to do that for sure. Um, but one of the things, oh, one of the things you guys can do if you are still listening. Hello. Subscribers, stop watching another program as you're because I'm rambling on about stuff that's not interesting to you, which is I shouldn't be doing. <laughs> but um, anyways, yeah, go to Reddit and say, hey, check out this guy pointed to a video. My top video is a Reddit point. It's uh, almost 10,000 views is my uh, special relativity is wrong. I went in there and tried to put stuff into Reddit about it and they go, you can't do your own stuff. Someone else has to do it. So hint hint that would help okay well listen thank you so much i really appreciate it. debbie it's always great talking with you um steve and adam 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 love to have in fact adam uh get in contact with me david at dissidentscience.com uh dot com uh, david at dissidentscience.com or david at thehilster.com my last name whatever and i'd love to get a lattice theory included into science woke because I don't have a lattice theory there. I have people who talk about them, but I don't have sort of anybody who's really described them that much. So, all right. Uh, so anyways, uh, thanks so much. And I appreciate uh, you guys uh, coming by. And like I said, go to Reddit, reddit.com. Say, hey, check out the Dissident Channel. There's nothing out like that, out there like that. So remember what I say, stay critical, stay thinking. I'm David D. Hilster, your science therapist, trying to get you to be science woke. Ciao for now. Thanks so much, subscribers. Thank you, everybody, for attending and watching for those who even made it this far in the recording, which sometimes I think it's up to 20%. Made it all this far. Thank you, 20%.